what we're going to cover. Okay, so I apologise for, uh, for the missing writing at the top. I'll just tell you what that is. It says, in this session, dot, dot, dot. Okay. How are learners different from each other? What are the different modes of working with mixed ability levels in class? And how can tasks be differentiated in a variety of ways to suit learners with different language levels? Are you familiar with this term of differentiation? Some of you, it's a good word, good technical word. Let's try pronouncing it now. Everybody, differentiate. 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 Differentiation. Differentiation. Good word. Use that and people will be very impressed. They'll go, ooh, that's a good word. Where did you learn that? All right. Now, what is it? We'll find out a little bit later. Um, I'd like us to think at this stage about how our students are different. I'd like you to work in small groups. You can have little groups of four. And this is a brainstorming activity. I love brainstorms. Sorry, I did this yesterday with my uh, other group in my workshop. Little brainstorming activity. How are students different from each other. And you can think of everything from things like height, to mental ability, to uh, boys or girls, etc. Ah, interest. Get thinking now about how students are different from each other in all aspects. And I'm going to give you two minutes to do that, and then I'm going to ring my bell. <laughs> Yes. So some can speak in a good way, some can't. Okay. This 
may be as a result of students' own attitude with the language. It may be to do with their interest in the language. It may be to do with their personality, their character. Some are shy, some are not. Um, so we can see the individual differences are a really important aspect of managing a large mixed ability class. I've got a list here. How are students different from each other? Do you agree with these points? Okay, so we've got personalities. Some students are very extrovert. Some are much shyer. Uh, gender. Now, I know in Palestine, I think... Uh, Boys and girls are separate. Okay, so not so much of an issue here. Different topic interests. You'll have students who are so interested in some topics and not interested in others. That's normal. Um, the varying language views of students. Some will love English and some won't. That's normal. Okay. Varying cognitive learning styles of students. You know you're familiar with the visual, auditory, kinesthetic elements. So within your group, you're going to have different learning styles. Varying sensory channels of students. So again, connected to learning styles. There will be some students who are very physical, who respond well to touch, to drawing, okay, to actions. And there are other students who maybe are much better with the visual aspects, etc. Multiple intelligences. Are you familiar with Gardner's yes, yes, theory? Yes, yes, yes. Good, all right. So you will have some students who are naturally more logical, mathematical, some who are more musical, more spatially aware, linguistically aware, exactly. Age mix. Now, you may say, well, you know, they're all the same age. Young learners mature at very different speeds to each other. And it's quite interesting that in the UK, if your birthday is in September, you tend to be the youngest child in the class. Okay? And there's nothing you can do about that. You can't choose when you're born. But if you think about young learners, um, if they are, let's say, 10 years old, or if they are 10 years old and nine months, that's a big difference at that age. Okay? So even though they're all in the same class, you may have one learner who is only 10 and another learner who is almost 11. And that makes a big difference in terms of, um, you know, sort of ma maturing of the, the, the sort of the, the cognitive abilities, etc. Different activity preferences. Um, my friends here mentioned speaking. Um, some students really love speaking activities. Others like listening to stories. Others like singing songs. They all have a preference. And at higher levels, there will be some students who really enjoy grammar analysis. And other students who don't like it at all. So they all have preferences for what they learn and also how they learn. Um, varying levels of students. So within your class, you will have students who are, because of their natural aptitude or interest in English, will be much better, more enthusiastic, more interested in what's going on. And as a teacher, we have to manage all of these differences within our classrooms. Now, this doesn't have to be negative. This can actually be positive. If you give students uh, a discussion activity, because of their differences, there will be different opinions. There will be different ideas. They won't all think in the same way. And this is why I find mixed ability classes something which we can find positive rather than something which we could have to always see as negative. Now, of course, the question for us as teachers is how we manage them effectively. And that's what we need to think about today. So let's move on from this. And thank you again for your own ideas. Um, I've got here some problems which teachers face. Uh, if you read these, you probably find them quite familiar to you. There are 11 problems which teachers express about mixed ability classes. And if you read these, I'm sure you'll find some which are familiar to you. For example, number one. Half the students have finished an exercise when the other half have only just begun. Okay? You've got fast finishers. You've got slow learners. How do you manage all of them? Number two, 
We've got a syllabus to finish, but most of the students are already behind. Number three, the stronger students get bored if I spend some time explaining to the weaker ones. Um, number four, weaker students sit at the back and start disrupting the lesson. Number five, the weaker students don't even try. They give up. Number six, the stronger students dominate in class. Okay, they're the ones that always put up their hands. They always have the answers. And the other students think, oh, well, he's going to answer or she's going to answer. I'll just relax. Number seven, in pair work, is it better to put strong and weak students together or weak with weak, strong with strong? That's a question that many teachers ask. Number eight, I don't know what level of activity or task is best for my lesson. What level should you have? I know we teach grade eight or grade seven or grade five, but in terms of the actual activity, what is the right level for students? Too easy, too difficult, or in the middle? Number nine, some students' homework is a disaster. I don't know how to correct it. Number 10, sometimes the really good students ask me difficult questions. One even corrected me. And number 11, the weak students ask me things in their mother tongue and want me to explain in it. In other words, they would prefer to hear more mother tongue rather than English. I'd like you to work with a partner in pairs. Just choose one or two of these statements, the ones that are the most uh, important for you. And I'd like you to decide what solution could you suggest to this teacher. Advice, please. Off you go. students get bored if I spend time explaining to the weak ones and my suggestion is to uh, give extra exercises for those who are brilliant uh, on the contrary I can give also uh, the weaker ones uh, things which are suitable for them so uh, this way I can manage both of them thank you very much Good, thank you. Um, I think we do have to address this problem of fast finishers. Do any of you have like um, a little box or a little bag in your classrooms with puzzles, riddles, little crosswords, word searches, which you can give to the fast finishers? Does anybody do that? Yeah. Um, I've known, teachers have told me that this works really well. So you have uh, a special place and you have these extra activities. Um, it's not more fill-in-the-gap activities or more kind of, you know, serious work. It's something which is a little bit fun. So it's a kind of reward for finishing fast. Um, I don't think students like it if they say, teacher, finished, and you say, good, now do exercise two. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Some students are happy to do exercise too, but if you say, great, okay, now why don't you do this puzzle, or why don't you read this joke, or why don't you do this word search activity, you're actually kind of giving them some extra work, but it's rewarding them for working hard. So I think we want to be positive and encouraging in that idea, but I think you're right, we do need to keep them busy but in a productive way. Thank you.
You know, it's interesting. I've worked with students and I've tried different methods. Um, sometimes I put strong with weak, sometimes weak with weak, strong with strong. Sometimes random, random, like take a number, you know, a number one with number one, number two with number two. They don't know who they're going to get. Sometimes I let them work with their friends. And I think you know your classes well. Yes, you know which students do work together well, and you do know which combinations work well. Um, sometimes I've seen friends working together. One student is extremely clever, extremely good at English, and the other student is much weaker. But because they're friends, they have a very yeah, no. good working relationship. I am against this idea because if I put the friends with the friends, they will chat with each other right. about their parents yeah. Uh, yeah. or matches maybe or whatever. So it is beneficial to put the strong with weak uh, students more than friends with the Okay, I, I think it depends on the class. Yes. Okay, yeah. And there are some friendship pairs which work well and others I agree where it doesn't. So you judge what you feel is best for your students. This particular problem we're coming back to later, okay? So let's save any other suggestions for later. Thank you so much for your ideas and for your discussion. Um, I do have a handout, okay? Uh, I have some handouts. I don't know if I've got handouts for everybody. If you don't have a paper copy, please contact British Council uh, by email and they will send you an electronic copy. Okay, no problem at all. But I do have some paper copies for people to take away at the end. And this handout has advice for all of these. Okay, so you're welcome to see if you agree or disagree. Um, an individual work can, in a mixed ability class, work very well because students are working alone. They're working at their own pace. You will have problems also with the fast finishers and with the slow learners. Um, but it is at least possible to monitor what students are doing and to address any problems like students finish quickly. You can give them other tasks to do. Um, other modes of working, they may work in groups. Yes. And again, depending on whether you have groups which are mixed ability or you're trying to give the group the same kind of ability, so all the strong students in one group, the weaker students in another group. Again, mixing groups can... Um, provide students with a lot of, um, I think, useful social skills as much as anything else in terms of negotiating and discussing with each other. You might have whole class work <coughs> where students are actually working as a class. This presents challenges, obviously, um, in terms of some students dominating. So as I said earlier, you may have your good students who always ask the questions and answer your questions, and um, the weaker students get ignored. There are ways you can manage that. How many of you like to ask the weaker students the easy questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you say, of course, Julieta. Um, no, I mean, there are lots of teachers who will, I have seen teachers choosing the weak students and asking them a difficult question. Just to, and they say, no, this, this motivates them, this encourages them. They'll be embarrassed, yeah, and they'll feel a failure, okay? They fail again and again in class. Um, and unfortunately, I think this leads to what we call a vicious circle. So weak students think, I can't answer the question, I won't raise my hand. And this failure leads on to other failure. If you ask the weak students the easier questions, for example, yes or no questions, if they answer, they feel good. Confident. Yeah, you increase their confidence, exactly. And you hope then that slowly they get a little bit more confident and able to contribute in class. Let's be honest, weak students, you know, they will always be weaker than the clever ones. This, this, is, this is life. We do our best to help them. And um, we do see some students who do make great improvements. But I think what we're aiming to do here is to try and help everybody achieve their potential. And some students' potential is very high, and some students' potential is lower. But we want everybody to reach their potential. But we have to accept within a class there will be brilliant students and there will be weaker students. But let's try to support all of them. 
So in your classroom, you may have these three possible modes of working. Uh, now, interestingly, we need to think a little bit about how we manage that. Okay, um, I've got an example here from English for Palestine, and I like this activity a lot. It says working groups of three or four make a comic strip. Why do I like that activity so much? Why is that so good for mixed ability so classes? Good. It's familiar for kids. It is familiar for kids. Yes, okay. So students are familiar maybe with the topic, they like the pictures. Think about the task. It's a story. Is there a, is there a right answer? No, 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 no. Okay. So it's what we call an open-ended task. In other words, the groups will make a story. Some groups will make a brilliant story. And it'll be full of adjectives and adverbs and descriptions. And it'll be fantastic. And you'll say, oh, let's put this in the newspaper. It's so good. Other groups will make a very simple story, okay? Maybe not so many adjectives, maybe more mistakes, but everybody will make a story. And so what's nice about this activity is because it's what we call open-ended, everybody will make a story to their own ability and their own level, and everybody will achieve something. Some will be simple, some will be difficult, but everybody will do something. And I think it's important in our classes, we have a range of activities and tasks, some of which are with a correct answer, and some which are like this, where there is no right answer. Um, in English for Palestine, you have a mix of these tasks, yeah? And I think it's important that we do these tasks so that our students feel that they have contributed in some way. Um, if you have a look at this worksheet, um, it's called Differentiated Tasks. Okay? And there are two groups, Group 1 and Group 2. Um, group 1 is on the first page, Group 2 is on the other side. Okay? Um, I just want you to choose either Group 1 or Group 2. And I'd like you to have a look at the activities that are suggested here. Because what we have is different ways of approaching the same task. And I think it's good for us to have a look at what this involves exactly. Have a look at your uh, activity, either on the first page or on the second page. And I'd like you to notice the difference with the different tasks here, and how might this work with different abilities in your classes? Okay, so, can you share, please? and the clever ones are going to be able to do it easily 
and the weak students are going to find this very, very hard. You have to then make your own task which helps the weaker students. And it may be that you have to create your own tasks to supplement those in your textbook. It may be that some of your students are really, really brilliant and they find the tasks too easy in the textbook, in which case you have to make something a little bit more difficult. So group one gives you some examples of how you can differentiate the tasks. So for example, uh, the first task, okay, uh, students have pretty much the whole text. Second task, Yes. And the third task is multiple choice. So which one gives students the most support? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right then. Um, so if students just have a blank paper, all right, then I'm afraid that is really difficult. That is true dictation. But then you may give support to other students by providing them with gaps or with choices of words. Okay. If you go over to task, uh, the tasks on the other side, this is storytelling. Again, very popular activity. Nick in the plenary uh, gave you some really lovely examples of stories and how you can tell them. And again, these three tasks give you options for support for students. So some students, weaker students, will get more support with others and different tasks to do. For example, weaker students maybe just draw pictures or they act. Right? The more uh, the cleverer students may be asked to write words, phrases, or they may be asked to actually um, finish the story. Yeah? How does the story end? So again, it's raising your awareness about the different tasks you can do with students to try and help the different abilities in class. Okay, time is running out. Let me just finish with um, a couple of suggestions here. Now, let me ask you if you've seen this model before. <laughs> Level-based groups. Um, I'm interested to know your opinion on this. Let me explain how it works. In your classrooms, do your students sit in rows? Yes. They do. Okay. Now, imagine this is your classroom and you have 36 students. Yes. Yeah. 59, or whatever, okay? Average class, 36. Now, this is a very interesting technique, okay? At home, you put all your students in order according to their ability. So, according to the exam results, who gets the best mark, who gets the worst mark, okay? And you put them in order, okay? You go into your class, and then you organize your students. Number one is actually the weakest student, and number 36 is the cleverest. <coughs> and they sit in order. Now, they don't know this. <coughs> well, they do know this, but you don't tell them, okay? And they sit in order like that. What's interesting is that then, when your students are sitting in this way, you can use this for group work. For example, letter groups are the same level, and colour groups are mixed level. So, for example, if you say the front rows, okay, work together as a group, they will all be about the same level, okay. Same with the last group. This will be all, okay. The cleverest students will be working together, either in pairs or in groups. If you, you, if you group them as colours, so if you say, okay, all the reds work together, all the yellows work together, what's happened? Mixed Mixed levels. Mixed levels. And you've got a clever student, clever student, weaker, 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 and then weakest. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, what is your opinion about this? I'll be honest, I've never tried this. this I don't know if it is a good thing to do. But does anybody have any strong feelings about this? Do you think it's good? Could it work? We need much more time. And more space. For what? To do that. How does it take time? 
You no no no. You just put the, they stay in the seats. They don't move. But there is no space to move. No no. They're not moving. Okay. You normally your students come in and they sit down uh, randomly. We have them yes. You order them. Pre you order them at home. You do the order, and then you say, okay, class, we we're changing seats today, and then you go, da, 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 and they sit according to this pattern, according to this model. You don't change the seating, this stays every day. Okay? Uh, how do you think the students feel? Do you think they know what's going on? No. You think they don't know? Okay, that could be good. <laughs> So, it helped uh, each student to uh, get the chance of learning by uh, sharing the uh, ideas and the uh, uh, class with others. Yes. Yes, that's true. And what happens is that if you if you have, for example, these this pair working together will be the more or less the same level, but this pair will be slightly different levels. Okay, that's how it works. Any other feelings about this? Yes. Sorry, everybody. Could could we listen, please? Sorry, I can't hear. Could we listen to, to just one person? Yeah. I divided my class into groups, and I'm going to see that for each group, and also at the time, I'm asking them to help each other. Right. It's more and then we invite them. Right. Okay. So you have another method for mixing students, pairs, groups, etc. Okay, fine. Um, this is just something for you to consider. If you like it, you might want to try it. Please email me. Tell me how it goes and what your students think of it. Let me finish then with this final thought before we go. Um, I'm going to give you, uh, you're welcome to take the case studies and have a look. Two case studies which um, show you teachers managing in two different countries the mixed ability classes that they have. I'd just like to finish with this particular quotation, uh, and I like it a lot, from um, a writer, a uh, teacher called Jim Rose. He says, a mixed ability class is like a lift. Yes. A lift, an elevator. Everyone needs to get into the lift to start with. Some students will run into the lift. Some will have to be dragged in. Some students will travel right to the top of the building. Some may stop at the third floor. And some may only reach the first floor. But everyone will have travelled somewhere successfully. At the end of a class, every student can leave the room feeling that they have been challenged and that they have achieved something, even if it's only small. So let's try to make sure that all of our students can achieve something Everybody in your is class. Eight. Everybody is I think that's a nice way to finish, definitely. Thank you, everybody. I have handouts. Thank you for your attention.